Hi, my name is Jen Crawford and I'm a fifth year in the Sigmund group. And with me today is Lori DeGaul. She's a fourth year in the Roberts group. And after each video in this module, um, she'll be asking questions since she's also going to be learning about conformational analysis. And so that brings me to what we'll be discussing today, which is the second installment of the short course, where we'll be discussing how do we account for conformations within the statistical modeling workflow. So just an overview of the videos that will be contained within this module is first we'll begin with this introduction discussing why do we consider conformers within statistical modeling, um, followed by an introduction to one of the aspects of the theory that we use to accomplish this goal, followed by some practical information for how we do these conformational searches, ending with a description of our high level calculations um, that rely on quantum mechanics um, to do those computations. And so why do we consider conformers? So quantum mechanical electronic and steric parameters, the molecular descriptors that we take um, in our statistical modeling workflow um, can vary quite a lot based on conformation. And this is particularly true for flexible molecules since they can have quite a large number of low energy conformations that would be relevant um, for the reaction. And so how do we really account for dynamics when we're acquiring these static numerical descriptors? And so one key assumption that we make here is that through conformational searching, we're able to efficiently sample an experimentally relevant conformational ensemble. And so one, you know, just example of how we might consider taking a static numerical descriptor and try to describe the dynamics of a system is by taking a number of different values um, from different conformations. And so why do we perform a conformational search, um, which is a method to access these multiple low energy conformations along the potential energy surface? So to begin with, we're thinking about the parameters or the molecular descriptors that we're obtaining from a molecule since they depend on that conformation. So shown here is an example of how much one particular steric parameter can vary based on the conformation selected. And this can range from around six all the way to 10, which is quite a large range. And this is a steric parameter. And so that shows that these are particularly variable. Furthermore, a reaction is highly dynamic, but a computation of a single molecule in a single conformation provides just a static snapshot versus the dynamic nature of the reaction itself. And we want to be able to really understand key interactions throughout a reaction coordinate. And finally, it's really important to find the global minimum conformation. And there are multiple minima ab across the potential energy surface. And finding these minima requires passing through regions of higher energy on the potential energy surface, which might be difficult with other computational techniques. One other important question in thinking about a conformational search is which molecules um, do we actually select um, for further computation? In the Sigmund group, we've selected catalyst structures, substrate structures, um, and then we've also truncated structures for simplicity to reduce computational cost. And so capturing dynamics and relevant conformers may be important for modeling. And I would like to note that a particular project may require modifying the specific protocol, but it's on a case by case basis. So I have um, some several questions for you. And um, for those on the call or viewing this, you don't have to um, listen to the rest of this, but um, could you actually go back to your first slide? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, my first question is, um, when you uh, mentioned low energy conformations, is there like a specific numerical value associated with low energy? Like what is the technical definition if there is any? So in general, when we do a conformational search, we set the cutoff as around, at around five um, kilocals per mole. Cool, thank you. Um, and then can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so on the far left, 
Um, so I know this is graph that you used here. Um, is there a specific name for this graph? And is there a, a purpose for using this graph? Is it just specifically to showcase steric parameters? So this um, plot type of plot in general is called a violin plot, and it can be used to show um, variation within a data within a data set. Um, so frequently, you can highlight the average or the quartile ranges. Um, but what's powerful about this plot is not only do you see the points, but if there are overlapping points, the density of points corresponds to how wide. Um, that particular section is. So from a visual sense, I can see that there are a lot of points clustered here and comparatively few here. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, for the middle uh, dynamic segment here, um, so for your own, I guess, per, from your own personal experience, when would it be best to use a static snapshot versus um, sort of like a dynamic snapshot computationally? Um, I think it's more important um, when the molecules that you're considering are very flexible and less important when a molecule is quite rigid. Um, but of course, um, this is something that we're exploring right now. So we're just now sort of trying to figure out how do we describe the dynamic nature of molecules and that's an active area of research in the group. Great. Um, and then for the minimus segment here, um, the potential energy surface that you're showing, is this of a reaction coordinate diagram or um, of uh, the conformers? So this is actually of the conformers. So while we typically think of a potential energy surface in the context of a reaction, we can also think of that conformational potential energy surface. We might have a low energy conformation here and then a high energy conformation here. So if you think about, you know, in the conformational analysis of butane, if you have an anti-conformation, um, you know, it'll be down here versus if you have an eclipsed conformation, it would be up here. Great, thank you. And then I have one final question on the last slide. Yeah. Oops. Okay, um, so um, my last question is, um, how do you know when you've truncated too much or too little? So this is a really good question. Um, it's really case dependent. And so if you have a system that's really complex um, and would require a lot of time to compute, in general, we'll try to pursue a truncation first, especially if we're, if we know that a particular structural element, um, changing that leads to a really bit large change in the reaction output, which was the case for this system. We noticed that changing this residue had a really large impact on the output. And so we really wanted to highlight um, this area of the catalyst for parameterization. And ultimately that ended up working out. But if it hadn't worked, um, we would have gone back and tried to find another way to consider the confirmations of the full catalyst. Cool, I have no other questions, thanks. Great, thank you so much um, for asking questions and being on this call. And that concludes the introductory video of this module. Um, stay tuned for part 2.1 where we'll be discussing molecular mechanics methods.